so good morning to one and all it's really a pleasure to have a, a person like strata of dr amal nelkar with us uh, and it's very difficult to define a person of strata like him who has more than 230 publications with more than uh, 6200 uh, uh, 6300 uh, citations 24 indian and 3 us patent along with three technology transfers and definitely it is be more if we uh, take today's thing he has uh, more than 100 invited talks in india and abroad uh, he has done his uh, uh, bsc chemistry from shivaji university and msc also uh, from shivaji university and uh, completed his phd from national chemical laboratory he has started his career in national chemical laboratory and in between he was uh, there in uh, japan as a research scholar visiting scientist in gifu university and uh, 2006 to 2007 he was brain pool invited scientist in korea research institute for chemical technology a very reputed institute he has taken over as a uh, director of cimet pune in 2007 and for two years he was director of cimet pune and subsequently he went to as a director general ceo of cimet of pune hyderabad trishul that entire cimet organizations and uh, subsequently uh, he uh, is connected with uh, so many uh, different universities and organizations of japan singapore switzerland saudi arabia slovenia and bulgaria to name a few his research interests are varied starting from electronic material nanoscale material nanobioscience energy materials whole lot of thing so whatever i say that will be nothing but a bird's eye view of the person who uh, uh, think of uh, designing the nano material synthesize characterize and every part of it so whatever i am telling that is nothing but looking at the surface of the nano material so we are really fortunate that uh, he uh, consented to uh, present a very interesting talk on both uh, uh, that top down as well as bottom up approach of photoconducting cadmium sulfide and so many awards uh, in his feather couple of them in our uh, maharashtra academy of science elected fellow recipient of uh, esteemed medal by material research society of india for outstanding contribution in material science and uh, engineering and three times he is recipient of prestigious brain pool fellowship by ministry of science korean government so we are really fortunate to uh, have a discussion and uh, views and perception from dr kamalnekar sir and he is associated with our department as a uh, uh, emeritus scientist so we are really fortunate to uh, interact with and uh, uh, work with him for some interesting projects what do you want to sir okay uh, <coughs> thanks uh, dr nandi uh, can you hear me and see my slides also yes sir it's uh, uh, audible and visible everything is fine okay okay so for this particular session uh, on nanotechnology i presume that most of you are aware about the terms and concepts revolving around the nano science and nanotechnology so i'm not going to explain you know all such things uh, related to nano science and nanotechnology because nano is a buzz word and maybe most of you either might be having information available on the net or you yourself might be working in this particular area my talk is on revisiting photoconducting cadmium sulfide top down photo patternable micro photo sensor and bottom up hierarchical nano structures for field emission devices the title is uh, too, too big i know but then i'll try to explain the all the terms like photoconductivity photo patterning micro photo sensor hierarchical nano structures and to some extent field emission devices in my talk the work for this particular present thematic presentation has been done some 10 years ago by my phd students at the uh, center for materials for electronics technology but i feel this research is still relevant as on today how and why let us see in my presentation 
At the outset, uh, I will present, I will try to familiarize you with some of the basic concepts involved in the photoconductivity phenomenon. At the same time, offer the essence of photoconducting materials from the application point of view. I have, I have structured my presentation in two parts. Part one deals with photovariable microphotosensors, and part two deals with hierarchical nanostructures for the field emission devices. So this is a typical uh, rather uh, uh, top-down approach, and this is a bottom-up approach. And with the example of cadmium sulfide, there are reasons why I'm selecting cadmium sulfide is a material, material of choice for this particular work related to photoconductivity phenomenon. Now let us first see what is in my photoconductor. Photoconductor, also called as a photoregister, also called as a photocell or photoconductive cell, is a resistor whose resistance decreases with intensity of light. In a simple language, the material which is otherwise insulator can become conducting when light falls on that. It is nothing but photon induced conductivity, such a simple definition. But we need to write some complicated definition like this. Photoconductivity is an optical and electrical phenomenon in which material becomes more conductive by absorption of electromagnetic radiation, such as UV radiation, visible radiation, IR radiation, etc. So this kind of uh, bookish definition is required to get good marks uh, in the examination. And uh, whenever I read this definition, I remember the three idiot movie where a professor virus us through the ass uh, rancho define machine and he says in a simple language anything which makes our life easy and simple that is a machine but professor is not happy with that he's requesting chatur to tell such a complicated definition but in in reality what machine does it does the same thing whatever ranch was said so in reality it is photoconductivity is nothing but photon induced conductivity in a material forget about this big definition so let us see what are the basic electronic processes um, involved in the photoconductivity phenomenon for which uh, let us consider an n type of uh, large band wide band gap semiconducting material uh, you know for example cadmium sulfide and probably all of you might be knowing a little bit about the uh, valence band and conduction band in this is n type material so valency band is fully occupied with the electrons and conduction band is empty and the and this band gap, which is just energetic position between the bottom of the conduction band and top of the valence band. There are some imperfection center states in between. These are called sub band gap imperfection states. Sub band gap means within the band gap. And what are the imperfection states? They might be either uh, intrinsically available in the lattice at the thumb state uh, or shockley state. These are called intrinsic defect states or might be intentionally created in the photoconducting material by doping with certain impurities which can enhance the photosensitivity. So we have intrinsic sets, we have imperfection centers intentionally created within the man gap. Now let us see what is the first process. When you excite the host crystal by absorption of light with energy equal to more than the man gap, what happens? The photo excited electron is generated in the conduction. It means this electron, by absorbing energy, photon energy, it gets excited and goes to the conduction band, whether it can, it's available freely for movement and generate the current. Now, this photo excited electron leaves behind a positively charged photo excited hole. Now, let us see what is the second process. Second process is excitation of bound electron at an imperfection level. This imperfection state has already got excited electron in that, which gets excited and goes to the conduction band. What is the process three? Capture of photo excited hole by an imperfection center. The hole, the photo excited hole, which was created here, gets due to some region, gets captured here in this particular imperfection center. And uh, let us see what is the process for? Capture of the photo excited electron has been generated. The photo excited electron it gets captured by this center which has previously captured by photo excited hole resulting in the recombination of the charge carriers here whole idea is to delay the charge carrier recombination for example the moment you excite the host crystal by a suitable photon the photo excited electrons and holes 
they tend to recombine because this is uh, not the natural state for them uh, it they try to recombine as far as possible as immediately as far as possible now to deal with that if you have this kind of two states in between we can find the delay of life of electrons in the conduction band which is important step in the photoconductivity phenomenon i hope you are getting what i am saying now process five is the capture of photo excited electron by electron trapping center this electron can get trapped here then this is the thermal fring of the trapped uh, electron this is continuous uh, equilibrium of uh, trapping and what we call untrapping of that then this is the uh, Thermal fring of trapped electron, optical fring of a trapped electron, and the last process is uh, what is that called? Thermal fring of the captured hole. So these are nine basic electronic processes. So let us see what they do. The process one and two, they are responsible for the spectral response of a photoconducting material or a photoresistor. It is also called as light dependent register also termed as photocell or photoconductive cell but it's, in fact it's uh, you know photocell or photoconductive cell is really misnomer there's just a change in resistance with the light there is no electrical current drawn out of this particular device but somehow traditionally it has been called as a photoconductive device so the steps one and two determine the spectral response what is spectral response photo current versus wavelength of excitation plot that is spectral response then processes uh, three and four, these two processes determine, as I explained earlier, the lifetime of free carriers, in this case, electrons in the conduction band, and ultimately photosensitivity. Because photosensitivity, I'm showing, going to show this in my equation a little later. Photosensitivity is basically controlled by the lifetime of uh, free carriers in the conduction in the conduction band. And if, what is photosensitivity? Is it nothing but dark resistance upon photoresistance or photocurrent upon dark current? That defines the photosensitivity. Now, these two processes uh, define, these processes uh, determine the speed of response. What is speed of response? Speed of response is how fast your photoconductor in reacting or in determining the changes with respect to external stimulus that is light. How fast? Your material is that is the speed of response now please remember the spectral response the photosensitivity and the speed of response all these uh, are supposed to be important device parameters of a typical photoconductor or photoconductive cell now let us see a typical photoconductor in operation again we consider the wide band gap semiconducting material like cadmium sulfide with uh, two ohmic uh, contacts, cathode and anode. With the absorption of a photon, it forms a free electron and hole pair. It puts an electron is generated here, hole is generated, which leaves behind the hole. Then, under the influence of uh, applied electrical field, the poster excited electron travels or moves towards the anode, the positive charge electrode. At the same time, the photo excited hole moves towards the negatively charged uh, cathode. But in between, its life gets uh, terminated by capture at an imperfection center. Now, the moment this photo excited electron leaves the photocatalytic surface, what happens? We have seen that under the influence of applied electrical field, the photo excited electron moves towards the cathode, moves towards the anode. When it comes here, it leaves the photoconductor uh, surface immediately the positively charged, residual positive charge left behind forces another electron from this ohmic contact to, sub, to be supplied by the cathode. And this, so there's a continuum of uh, electronic flow in a photoconductor material. So what? let me repeat. After the initial electron has left the photoconductor at anode, the residual positive charge left in the material leads to the entrance of another electron into the photoconductor from the cathode. That is because of the ohmic nature of the contact. So this is a typical photoconductor in operation. Now I'll spend some time here to talk about the applications of photoconductor. Traditionally, photoconductors find place in many consumer applications like a smoke detector, flame detector. Photocopier is an important application. Probably you might be knowing the 
the photocopiers are still made out of uh, selenium kind of uh, photoconductor. Camera shutter was a popular application earlier, but by these days, nobody uses uh, this kind of cameras for photography. With the advent of mobile, everything has been come to an halt. There's also some application in water purification. But I'll spend some time in explaining you about the street light control. The photoconductor or light dependent resistor, that is LDR enable street light control circuits find uh, popularity in the Western world worldwide for the decades together. So what is the use of this kind of LDRs in the street light control? So this LDRs are smart sensors. LDRs can judge these certain levels of outside darkness or ambient darkness or ambient uh, light and turn on rather switch on the street lights or switch off the street lights depending upon the situation. So this can lead to a lot of energy saving. And I have seen this is, uh, you know, way back in 1986-87, I was surprised to see that um, the street light controls were in place based on, again, cadmium sulfide LDRs. Now, what I have seen earlier in, in India, maybe a couple of years ago, street light control circuits are typically manual, manually operated at certain fixed time, maybe 7 o'clock in the morning or 7 o'clock in the night. Irrespective of the fact that there's a total darkness or total, total light, still you'll find suddenly the street lights were on on the streets maybe at 8 o'clock in the morning and no light till 8 o'clock in the evening. So that kind of situation, that's because of the manual operation and fixed time on and off of street lights. That was the problem. So probably it might have incurred heavy energy losses previously, but I was told uh, by Dr. Govin, who is my student, who has worked on this. He has, he has told me with the with the uh, rather smart city concept, probably this kind of LDR-based street light control circuits will be placed even in many cities, including Pune. He also told me that the big housing complex. I have, of course, I have seen in Japan and Korea recently. The big housing complexes, the big townships, they already they have already started using the LDR enable street light uh, sorry, street light controls everywhere. Just as a part of the energy saving, which will be a great contribution. Now there are some of the advanced applications. I'm not going to talk much about that. Posteric hand, robotic. We have some cons you know some idea about how to create robotic eye using our own research optical switch. Maybe in medicine, early missile threat warning is an important application of cadmium sulfide based uh, LDR. Now I'm going to talk about uh, you know this advanced application uh, like uh, autocar dimmers in the automobile vehicles. Imagine the situation of nighttime traffic where many vehicles you know that travel you know the transport or the travel with uh, full uh, light on that is called upper totally on high intensity lights are on so when the two vehicles approaching each other come in contact in the close port of proximity there is a problem there is an effect called Trostler effect which creates a temporary blindness because of this glare very intense light very intense upper light for both the drivers it causes a temporary blindness and even if this blindness lasts for a few seconds that can probably lead to fatal accidents. That's why the, the, you can find a lot of uh, car accidents or vehicle accidents are taking place, typically in the night. If you have the LDR-based autocar dimmer uh, circuits in this particular, come I mean, in both the cars or in each and every vehicle, if you make it mandatory, what will happen? Probably the situation is like this. When the car comes in close proximity with each other, the, it, the car dimmer automatically switches the headlight towards deeper mode. So no upper mode, only deeper mode. And then because of that, probably you won't get that kind of a glare on for both the drivers and no toxic effect. And there's less chance of that you will have an accident. If you are sleeping, probably accidents will still occur. And then car can leave. And again, the headlights are fully on. So this is an important application. And probably you'll be surprised to know that General Motors introduced this kind of concept to autocar device based on cadmium sulfide photoconductor way back in 1952. 
I don't know why it's not uh, becoming mandatory as far as the uh, Indian situation is considered. So we, okay, we say that we have four lanes and there is no two-way traffic. So there's no possibility of head-on collision. But, but in, in any case, if this troxel effect uh, happens, it can also lead accident by rather uh, heading towards the, the road dividers and still accident can take place even with the on on highway. That's a reality even Western world has seen. Now let us see the electromagnetic spectrum versus photoconducting materials. All materials under the sun can become photoconducting if you have a suitable photon to accept that. Because what is photoconductivity? Photon induced conductivity. If you have a suitable photon, each and every material can become photoconductivity. But commercial photosensors of today or commercial LDRs of today are exclusively made out of the semiconducting materials like uh, zinc oxide, zinc sulfide, silicon, germanium, cadmium sulfide, cadmium selenide, lead sulfide, lead selenide, antimony, uh, you know, antimonide, so on and so forth. Typically lying from uh, rather uh, uh, far UV, far UV to visible and near iron range. It can cover something like 300 to 1000 nanometers for the commercial application. Out of all such materials, cadmium sulfide is a material of choice. Why? Because it possesses high sensitivity, high sensitivity response in the visible region, matching well with the human eye. What I mean by this? What I mean by this is this, you know, it, it is uh, shown in this particular diagram. This particular green light is the spectral response of human eye, which exactly matches well with the spectral response of cadmium sulfide. That's why it found application earlier in the camera shutters, but no such cameras are outdated. Now, this, this red line, this red curve indicates uh, spectral response of amorphous silicon sensor far away little far away from the human spectral response. Single crystal silicon sensors indicated by this curve and the light blue and the sunlight here, this is the fluorescent light and the sunlight, all such spectral response curves are far away from the spectral response of the human eye. That is why cadmium sulfide, it's a material of choice because it possesses high sensitive response in the visual range which matches well with the human high. It has got a very large dynamic range of operation. It has got excellent ruggedness, easy and low cost for customization, good linearity as far as the applied voltage and intensity of excitation is considered, excellent performance to cost ratio, and uh, it has got a typical band gap of 2.4 electron volt, which is good enough to add some interest to dope and make it uh, more photoconductivity. So all such characteristics make cadmium sulfide photoconductor is the sensor of uh, choice. So this is, uh, I have already seen that. Let's see some of the typical properties of cadmium sulfide, like uh, it has got a direct band gap. I'm sure most of you know about the concepts in uh, solid state chemistry, solid state physics, like valence band, conduction band, band gap, direct band gap, indirect band gap. So, so it has a band gap of something like 2.5 electron hold. It has got a crystal structure, which is either cubic or hexagonal, sometimes mixed of both. Then let's forget about this lattice constants, et cetera, et cetera. This is just an, some uh, information which is useful for the researcher. Now let us see the historical perspectives of cadmium sulfide in its timeline. Cadmium yellow, this is nothing but cadmium sulfide. It's a chemical compound, cadmium sulfide, which is remarkably whose remarkable history began with an accidental discovery. Okay, just forget about that accidental discovery. So the cadmium sulfide, uh, probably its combination with some of the other materials like mercury and zinc can generate very fascinating colors. And uh, we can see one of the painting here. The compounds that produces them are a family of semiconductors and material scientists must study that because of the some of the phenomenon like photoconductivity. So this is a famous painting by Dutch artist Van Gogh. And all these flowers, for the, all the, the painting all these flowers, he has used cadmium sulfide and its uh, compounds with mercury and zinc while you know making his own paint formulation. Knowingly or unknowingly, unknowingly, he has created 
nanomaterials in this pens also. So what I'm going to show that, we already seen that cadmium sulfide is a good photoconducting material and has got a lot of application. So it has become a center of attraction for the scientists a couple of years ago. Same times, it attracted the attention of uh, artists also. So artists and scientists probably can think in the same direction. That is what uh, uh, I'm talking about that. So let us see a typical timeline of cadmium sulfide research. The research on cadmium sulfide dates back to early 19th century, but most of the research initially was confined to the peaks, to the, to the rather pigments, paints, and the health hazards. From probably 1940 onwards, we can see some papers related to development of serious crystal by various methods, and still health hazard or health, human health was an important aspect uh, for their studies. So from 1950 onwards to still maybe up to 1975, we can find a lot of reports related to bulk cadmium sulfide. I'm talking about bulk cadmium sulfide for various applications like uh, diode, photosynthesis, etc. And thanks to radio corporation of scientists from Radio Corporation of America, led by Professor Bu and Professor Rose, and also from the leading researchers from Stanford University. Radio Corporation of America has made immense contribution from 1950 to up to 1975 for this particular work related to photoconductivity in cadmium sulfide. But today, where is RCA? Nobody knows where is Radio Corporation of America with such a big industrial giant with extremely good facilities, well equipped with extremely good facilities in their research laboratory today. Nobody knows. What I just recently uh, read about that. The RCA existed in United States for quite some time, but it has been now acquired by Korean giant Samsung Electronics. So let us see what happened subsequently. From 19, maybe 70 to maybe late 1980s, we can find a lot of publications related to fabrication of large array devices for military and domestic application by various fabrication techniques like evaporation, sputtering, chemical bond equations, spraying and thick films, etc. But suddenly, from uh, 2000 onwards, we can find a huge influx of papers on photoconducting cadmium sulfide confined to nanocentric synthesis techniques. These synthesis techniques produce quantum dots, nanoparticles, nanowires, nanobales, nanoflowers, nanoribbons, all kinds of uh, nano architecture. And that's what we can see that this timeline probably has been, can be segmented in three regimes, earlier regime of peaks, uh, paints and uh, pigments, and uh, the second regime related to devices, thanks to uh, RCA and Stanford University. And the latest regime is on nanocentric synthesis techniques with photoelectronic device applications in mind. Now I'll talk about, uh, you know, part one, that is photo patternable micro photo sensor. So let us first uh, see what are photo patternable thick films. Photo patternable thick films are a combination of classical thick film paste and photosensitive polymers. Here, probably you can see in this slide. So this is a standard thick film process used in hybrid microtonic circuits, where we can make the thick film paste, screen print of certain rheology, print it on the alumina substrate, subject it to drying, and a typical, this firing means not really firing. It is heating, uh, you know, in the, with cert at certain peak temperature for peak firing time. This is a, a standard thick film technology. Now, let us go back to this. The photo patternable thick films are a combination of classical thick film paste and photosensitive polymers. Now, what is this uh, photo imageable thick film process? Here, the print and drive tray, you know, probably steps are the same. Print, drive, fire, post, but then a little bit different. In while formulating the photoimageable thick film paste, we add certain photosensitive polymers so as to create a certain line and space resolution. What is that? I'm going to talk about that. So addition of photosensitive polymers and two more steps, exposure, 
regeneration and develop, aqueous development these are the two important steps and uh, this photodefinable thickening paste it's something similar so the main distinct feature of the photopatternable thickening paste are detoning rheology of the paste required for labeling while classical thickening paste demand thixotropic rheology and the desired pattern realized by UV exposure and eco-friendly development these are some of the important aspects to be considered let's quickly see it again in a classical thick film technology, you make a thick film paste, or maybe you can get the thick film paste ready made uh, available in the market, print it on the substrate using some pattern, then subject it to drying and firing at certain peak firing temperature and time cycle. Then also you can prepare your yourself photoevigible thick film. Go in, I'm going to talk about uh, that a little later. Photoevigible thick film paste, same paste here but with a different rheology and because of the addition of photosensitive polymers there are two more steps in photodefinable thick film paste print dry fire and exactly same but in order to get the fine line and space resolution we have added uh, two more steps involved in the classical uh, photoregist technology so this is what uh, about um, photo imaging photo imaging technique photo imaging and photo defining these are there's two approaches towards photo patterning of the material. Now, what, why we need photo patterning, either photo imaging or rather photo defining? Why? Because they can lead to excellent electrical properties. Most importantly, spatial geometrical resolution less than 100 micron is possible. Now, but traditional thick film technology, you can't get this kind of uh, line and space resolution that's because there's a this is a limitation on the technique itself you can just get you know maximum you can get 150 micron less than 150 micron is literally impossible by classical thick film technology that is why we wanted to switch over to this particular technology and this um, line and switch is quite comparable to relatively cumbersome and energy intensive thin film technology it, it is possible by other techniques like thin film technology, but which is cumbersome, energy intensive, and not amenable to mass production. It leads to good edge definition, which is very important property, relatively smooth surface, which is also important property, and it leads to high density interconnection possible. That's because of uh, this kind of uh, geometrical resolution, less than 100 micron, relatively lower cost, with proven reliability and production capability of uh, classical thick film materials, and most importantly, since we are going out with the aqueous development, it's an environmental friendly process. So this is one example of uh, photo imageable silver based conductor paste and its pattern. The work has been done by Dr. Boeing, who is going to, who is the next speaker. Uh, and he has, this is PhD topic also. We have got a project from our ministry uh, quite some time ago to develop photo visual conductor paste and let us see what we could get in that we have made a test pattern here this is unfired it means not heated sample you can very clearly see 50 micrometer line 50 micron lines very clearly you can see now after firing that becomes 30 micron so this is uh, probably impossible by traditional classical thick film technology well, where we can get maximum 150 micron, not, not even 100 micron, it's easily possible. Here, we can get 30 micron. This is our own test pattern. But if you have a little um, you know, high resolution image, same image here, probably you can see there is a, some problem with the edges. And uh, this we feel that um, to get the 30 micron lines, we can't use the silver of micron size as the starting materials definitely you need a lot of uh, you know nanotechnology related synthesis techniques to generate the nanoscale silver which can be suited for this particular application to avoid this kind of uh, problem at the edges now why should we have photo patterning in cadmium sulfide let us see the conventional thick film photoconductor if you go to the market and purchase any photosensor or LDR, probably up based on cadmium sulfide, probably you will see this kind of a pattern 
a yellow color or brown color and this intellectual distance this is the surface electrode structure so the intellectual distance is maybe may of the order of uh, half a millimeter or sometimes one millimeter and the theory says that photocurrent is directly proportional to the intensity of excite uh, intensity of excitation applied voltage and product of the mu, mu and tau this mu is the mobility and this is not t actually tau which is the lifetime of free carriers so it is directly proportional to this product mu and tau but inversely proportional to the square of the intellectual distance if you keep on reducing the intellectual distance probably you will get the maximum photocurrent but this is a surface electrostructure. If you indefinitely reduce the intellectual distance, you will not find any place of, for cadmium sulfide here, which is available for photon catchment area. Where photons can be caught? Where is the photon catchment area? Then, you, okay, maybe you have a zigzag structure, but that's also not really useful. So we thought, why not to use a photo patterning technique and try to have intellectual distance of the order of 100 microns in comparison to half a millimeter so that this because of this L square inversely proportional to the L square we can get the maximum photocurrent this means we, if we do that if you are successful in reducing the distance probably you can make highly photosensitivity micro photosensor and this we call the bulk photosensor with this bulk standard definitely uh, this 100 micron line at intellectual distance is a micro photosensor. That's why we call it a micro photosensor. Let me repeat again here. The whole idea here is to reduce the intellectual distance from maybe half, from half a millimeter to 100 micron as a result of which photocurrent can increase inversely with the square of the intellectual distance. That was the idea of switching over to photo patterning of uh, photocurrent calcium sulfide. Now, how do we prepare the photo patternable cadmium sulfide paste? For which it, we, we take activated cadmium sulfide and then we mix it with the polymeric binder and photo initiator. Since we have filed a patent, I'm not going to describe much about this, but I'll definitely talk about uh, the activation of cadmium sulfide. See, cadmium sulfide in its highest purity state. Is not so photoconducting. You need to add intentional dopants like copper or chlorine compensated copper to create a sensitizing state in the subband gaps of cadmium sulfide. This is, for example, cadmium sulfide band gap, valence band, conduction band, and you can see a copper state here. Now, what happens in the stopping process? I'll try to explain in a very simple uh, manner. You have undoped cadmium sulfide. Obviously, it doesn't show much photoconductivity. What is this? It contains CD plus 2 and S minus minus, S minus 2 sub lattices. Now, when we dope with uh, chlorine and copper, what will happen? This S minus 2 can be replaced with Cl minus and CD plus 2 can be replaced with uh, Cu plus. So since, um, you know, this is Cl minus and this is Cu plus, the overall charge neutrality has been maintained but it creates an interesting situation please consider it again this is cl minus this is cu plus cl minus by replacing s minus minus cu plus by replacing cd plus plus now cu plus because of its only one positive charge is supposed to have effective negative charge in comparison to two positive charges of CD plus 2. It has two positive charges. It has only one positive charge. So this is supposed to be, this is supposed to be considered as um, a site with effective negative charge. Since it has got effective negative charge, probably it exerts Coulombic repulsion for the photoaxial electrons in the conduction band. And since the photoaxial electrons spend a lot of time in the conduction band, the tau here is proper tau tau increases and since, since tau increases photocurrent increases that situation is not available here so let me repeat here this is an interesting situation cu plus 
in comparison to CD, CD++ has got effective negative charge which exerts Coulombic repulsion towards photoisotel electrons in the conduction band of calcium sulfide ultimately leading to enhancing tau since lifetime increases photocurrent also increases that is the theory of uh, activating pure cadmium sulfide highly pure cadmium sulfide 99.9999% uh, cadmium sulfide with uh, chlorine and copper how do we do that we take cadmium sulfide which is a typical photoconducting matrix very high purity add cadmium chloride in that also add copper chloride in that and then we subject it to ball milling and carry out bulk firing in air at 500 degrees centigrade for two hours as a result of which we get activated cadmium sulfide how do we know we have got activated cadmium sulfide the first test is visual change in color the material in the pure form cadmium sulfide in the pure form is yellow in color which become rather brownish or reddish in color after activation process of course there is a change in uh, crystal structure also the undoubt material undoubt cadmium sulfide in my case at least uh, we can find it is a cubic dominated mixed phase cubic 85 percent hexagonal 15 percent while after doping it becomes perfectly hexagonal structure and this is the atomic force microscopy because i just said that uh, we even if to get the 30 micron line or maybe in 100 micron line in this case we cannot have the micron scale uh, activated uh, photo uh, photo material that is cadmium sulfide and this fm confirms to some extent that we are getting if not uh, nano at least a sub micron size of uh, uh, nano scale uh, sulfide doped with chlorine compensated copper now we have got a functional powder like activated cadmium sulfide that is doped with copper and chlorine then we mix it with binder and photo initiator and formulate a paste now what we do with this paste i'm not going to talk uh, much about all these steps probably we will just uh, briefly touch upon some aspects of it i don't know as far as photo image or silver paste is concerned uh, but we have gotten an uh, international patent which i will just talk in a minute about that so what is our approach in the fabricating in uh, photo patternable micro photosensor this is all photo patternable micro photosensor we start with photo patternable silver paste and then we take the silver paste which has been formulated by dr govin in our own laboratory and then we subject it to total screen printing on aluminum substrate entire substrate gets uh, screen printed then we expose this particular film through ultraviolet radiation through positive mass of uh, certain uh, you know um, structure desired geometry well what is exposed here now we are please remember here we are trying to create silver electrode so whatever is exposed this portion this portion gets uh, hardened and this portion which is unexposed because of the mask can be removed by aqueous development that is the you know, maybe sodium carbonate uh, aqueous development we carry on in our laboratory now we see here we, this is the surface let me repeat again this is the surface electrostructure and we need to create a interelectrode distance between two electrodes of the order of 100 micron now this space is available for photo patterning of cadmium sulfide how let us see now after the aqueous development we subject uh, this pattern for typical thick film firing at uh, 800 degrees centigrade for one hour firing cycle with peak firing of 10 minutes and when the thick film gets matured, electrode gets matured like this, we try to deposit photo patternable copper doped cadmium sulfate base, which has been formulated in our own laboratory. Here, what we do, same steps. Here we screen print on the you know the previously printed uh, silver electrode pattern, but this time we use the negative mask for exposure to V lights. Negative mass is the exact replica of the earlier one. So that wherever this space is available, you know, material gets hardened after UV exposure and the other remaining cadmium sulfate can be removed by aqueous development treatment. And then it is subjected to firing at uh, 85 degrees centigrade for 10 minutes to mature the photo pattern cadmium sulfide in this particular 
device. Now our device is ready. So he earlier applied for Indian patent, uh, it has been granted and still uh, we have what for the second, I think for last uh, uh, 10 years, or maybe more than 10 years, it filed in uh, 2010. We also got a uh, PCT application, but ultimately we filed US patent uh, for this particular work by uh, Dr. Govind. Now these are some of the, uh, see, this integral distance is so small, maybe of the order of 100 micron or little less than that. So we can't see through our naked eyes. We need stereo micrographs of the act to see the actual photo pattern patterns. These are typical samples, the stereo micrographs, actual samples. Let us see, um, let's quickly see the important property. Okay, we claim that we have made a microprotosensor with proper ohmic contacts of silver. What is the guarantee that the ohmic contacts have been formed? This is the first state. If you see both the dark current versus function of the field and the photo current as a function of field, we can get a straight line which indicates the ohmic nature of silver for this particular uh, cadmium sulfide. Then there's a typical behavior, sublinear, linear, or superlinear of photo current versus intensity of excitation. This is a typical behavior pattern depending upon the exposure level and also the concentration of copper in cadmium sulfide. I'm not going to talk much about that. We have confirmed sublinear, linear, and superlinear behavior in the present case also, which can be explained by using the simple classical models proposed by Professor Bew and Professor Albert Rose. Uh, but for the positive time, I'm not going to explain all. Speed of response is very important character. And here you can see there's on and off and on and off. And certain percentage of the, you know, this um, rise and fall curves, we determine the rise and, uh, you know, what is called decay time uh, for our work. I'm not going to talk much about that. It takes a little time. Spectral response, it is again, as I said, which is voltage, basically it is photocurrent versus wavelength of excitation. We get lambda max, the maximum peak at 560 nanometer, which corresponds to band gap of say 2.5 electron hole. And we can also see a shoulder here at la wavelength equivalent to say 650 nanometer, which can be due to the impurity excitation, that is the excitation from copper impurity to conduction band of cadmium sulfide. So we can see this is a typical pattern for the doped cadmium sulfide. Now let us quickly summarize uh, our results uh, for a typical sample. These are the device dimension, spectral response we have seen, 550 nanometers with a shoulder at 650 nanometer. These are the photoresistance values. What is photosensitivity? As I said earlier, dark resistance upon photoresistance, we get value of 10 to 2 for microphotosensor. But believe in me, in my own case, where I work on bulk photoconductivity, I have got highest reported value in the world, almost 10 to 9. But this is a microphotosensor with certain limitation. Most importantly, its rise time is just 10 millisecond. And although fall time is 105 millisecond. Rise time, very important. The rise time of commercial cadmium sulfate based photosensor is much more than 100 milliseconds. So what is the significance of this 10 millisecond? See, if I start looking at any object, maybe if I start looking at this computer, my brain approximately takes 25 milliseconds to understand what I am looking at or where am I looking at. 25 milliseconds. This value is much less. 10 milliseconds. That is why we feel that our material, our microprocessor, can have application in robotic eye and the prosthetic uh, hand. Dr. Govin has a plan uh, to do so, but is overloaded with a lot of uh, activities. Uh, and, but one good thing, CMAT has transferred this technology uh, to Ants uh, Ceramics Limited in, in Mumbai and in turn, the technology transfer costs are something like 15 lakh rupees. It's not a joke. You want to get 1 lakh rupees from industry is not a joke. And it has been recently, maybe I, I, I was in India at that time, 2017, I came for two days. And then Dr. Govind gave me this news. Uh, we, we got, at the CMAT got 15 lakh rupees for this technology transfer. So what is the imminence of photo imaging? Okay, here we can see the shit 
which just talks about photopatter level photo connectors she has thick film page for photosensor here we can see or we go back here the electrode distance is something like 100 micron but this this is a photo connector path length is something much more than that here we can see that this typical sample the, the electrode spacing is uh, approximately 100 micron but total length this is 100 micron but total continuous length is something like uh, 140 millimeter. So we have got a good photon catchment area. At the same time, intellectual distance has been reduced and both are equally good. Get high photosensitivity and, and much better to get less rice time. This is a typical uh, you know, selling aspect of our work. And we can recommend optical applications in optical switch, position sensor, high-speed object counter. And here, let me come back to the Trostler effect again and the nighttime accidents by the vehicles. If you have got autocar dimmers based on our micro photo sensor, canvas sulfide micro photo sensor, probably this Trostler effect, which otherwise um, you know can just happen for a few seconds, can be minimized by the circuit that is okay. But we just, just take just 10 milliseconds to get adjusted to proper circuit. So this uh, headlight control can be immediately switched within a fraction of a second, just 10 milliseconds or a little more than that. It can be switched over to deeper mode and accidents can be avoided. Now, we have been approached, maybe before I uh, retired in November 2014, we were uh, approached by Murata Electronics uh, company for this particular application. They said that we can develop autocar uh, dimmer circuits based on your material, but we, we ourselves cannot manufacture this kind of photo pattern level micro photo sensor. You need to find out somebody else to do that. Now, Dr. Govin, he got that uh, and ceramics in place maybe this can this activity can be reselected but um, maybe he has got another application related to defense and space i don't know what is his interest but that was some um, uh, we i made an uh, attempt to do so but subsequently i went to south korea and this work has taken a back seat so this is the uh, first part uh, of my presentation we have successfully explored the feasibility of using photo imageable process for fabrication of canvas sulfide based micro photo sensor. The results show that the photo imageable thick film technology will be of great interest to all designers and producers of thick film optical sensor with extremely fine geometries, less than 100 micron. You can't go really to nanoscale, but at least micron scale is very important and high sensitivity at economic rates uh, are, are required. And we propose uh, some of the applications like uh, micro photo sensor based uh, autocar dimmers and the street light controls. And the street light controls the idea has been is being routinely in, utilized in um, uh, under the smart city concept. Most of the housing, big housing complexes, and the townships in urban in in metro areas are using the street light controls. Why not to have? this kind of micro photo sensor for their application too. Now I'll talk about uh, hierarchical nanostructures by microwave-induced semi-salvothermal ray. Don't worry too much about this uh, microwave-induced semi-salvothermal rule. What I'm going to talk about a typical kitchen chemistry. In kitchen, we use the pressure cooker as well as microwave by these days. The semi-salvothermal is nothing but is a pressure cooker. And why semi thermal? Okay, it's a combination of organic solvent and water. If you just use, use water, this is called hydrothermal reaction. But if you use organic solvent instead of water, that is called thermal. But if you use combination of both the water and organic solvent, it's called a semi thermal route. So, okay, we just talked about uh, the hierarchical nanostructures obtained by microwave-induced semi-salvothermal route. Why we need this kind of hierarchical nanostructures? Maybe to understand morphology-dependent non-linear optical properties, which could be totally new as than today, or to explore dimension-oriented innovative photonics applications, lasers, filmmakers, etc. Let us see how far 
we we are successful at least in getting one application in place so this is a typical synthesis protocol we have mixed um, cadmium acetate and thiourea in certain minimal ratio in binary solvent mixture of uh, diethylene trimine and deionized water in uh, different ratios uh, this work has been done way back in 2007 in korea research institute of chemical technology in Crick. and then this mixture was transferred to a teflon coated autoclave that is our uh, pressure cooker which is uh, placed in the microwave digested a very good microwave digester with a lot of controls available at uh, korea research institute of chemical technology where my korean students had worked on that here the whole idea is after this part was all fine we have copied uh, the research from the chinese researchers but chinese researchers they have just taken cadmium acetate thiourea in certain same millimeter proportion mixed with diethylene triamine and ionized water in certain volume ratio put it in uh, autoclave exactly similar to us but they have heat they have, play, they have heated their uh, pressure cooker and they are used by using conventional heating mechanism which has taken 12 hours to get the desired uh, the desired morphology at 180 degrees centigrade so we thought micro reactions anyway will be so fast why not to go to micro reaction and this is the reason if you use uh, conductive heating and micro heating the normal chemical reaction which require minutes and hours sometimes days to get accomplished can be accomplished within minutes or maybe hours if we can switch over to micro heating instead of conductive heating so this is because micro leads to localized superheating it is said that the chemical reactions occur with the speed of light in microwave heating mode okay so instead of conventional heating mode like chinese researchers when it is integrated 12 hours we switch over to uh, uh, this particular microwave which was available in korea research of chemical technology and uh, we have done heating for say five minutes 10 minutes 20 minutes 60 minutes and we could get exactly the same results which Chinese researchers have obtained at, eight, at uh, 180 degrees centigrade for 12 hours of heating. So let us see. This is one particular uh, volume ratio. We can see this FESM. Maybe these are old FESM images uh, taken at uh, Korea Research Institute of Chemical Technology. We can find still the, this is not simple nanoparticles or spherical nanoparticles. These are called one dimensional nanostructures these are are precisely one dimensional quasi nanostructure these are not only one dimension is nano everything is not in nano this is so this is called quasi nanostructures one dimensional quasi nanostructures or their mixtures which is also called as hierarchical nanostructures now hierarchical nanostructures is much more seen here this is another ratio of diethylene triamine to DNS water one to six we can see the sea urchin kind of uh, morphology hierarchical nanostructure for this particular concentration now this doesn't show apparently the hierarchical nanostructure this particular ratio but when you have taken the FETM the results were much more clear for this particular volume ratio one to one we can see this is a nano cobweb kind of a morphology and nanorods can be clearly seen for one to six uh, volume to volume ratio, we can find maybe a nano boy kind of uh, morphology and the rods and the, the facetted growth can be clearly seen here. Most importantly, when we have used DTA and HDNS water into six to one ratio, we can see this kind of floral pattern. Please remember, we observed this way back in 2007 using normal FETM with no more advanced features associated with that but still we could get beautiful floral structure this is one rod plus all of that then on the top of that there's another rod and we can get a floral pattern that is what uh, we interpreted then we tried to, to we wanted to know why are we getting the hierarchical nanostructures all the time in this kind of uh, semi-solvothermal route under the microwave condition 
we very carefully studied our X-ray diffractogram and we noticed that this is just not hexagonal structure. It is the hexagonal structure of cadmium sulfide with 0, 0, 2. Everywhere we are seeing 0, 0, 2, that is blessed plane orientation. This 0, 0, 2 plane is such that it contains either cadmium ion or sulfur ion. So these are called the polar surfaces. So when the plane which just contains cadmium comes in contact with sulfur, there is a hierarchical buildup, one dimensional buildup. That is what is said here. The presence of polar surfaces, as I said, cadmium it contains either so cadmium or visible. Uh, what? What? What is not visible? Hello. Hello. Somebody speaking. Sir, Hello? everything is visible. No problem. Uh, Sir, there might be problem uh, in his continuing. Uh, somebody is coming here. Okay. Let me repeat. Yes. Right now it is visible. Right now it is visible. It is visible. Why? Why somebody said it's not visible? Maybe his computer has a problem. Okay. The presence of polar surfaces, like as I explained, it is a 0, 0 to preferred orientation, either contains uh, S or contains uh, CD, ion. Then uh, these are called basically cation anion terminated atomic planes, which lead to hierarchical buildup in typical hexagonal structure. Let me repeat again the cadmium containing plane comes in contact with sulfur containing plane, and there is a hierarchical one dimensional buildup. This is where this is the way which we can explain in the generation of uh, hierarchical nano architecture. Now, after doing all these experiments, I returned to India and asked my another PhD student, Dr. Manish Shinde, uh, who is again a scientist at uh, CMET. Anyway, it's a micro reaction, and we have a micro digester, something similar to uh, Korea Institute of Chemical Technology at my institute. So why not? to go for 140 degree centigrade instead of 180 degree centigrade. He did that. This is just 10 minutes heating, and we could get the same result, 0, 0 to preferred orientation, and these are color enhanced uh, SM images obtained, uh, FSM images obtained uh, maybe in 2010. We can clearly see the, the, you know, the presence of uh, hierarchical buildup, which is much more visible in the FETM, we can see. These are the, you know, this is the branch tree kind of uh, morphology we can see. There is a main branch, along with the main branch, there are side branch. These are point tree kind of structures we can see. Uh, even if we carry out this micro-induced reaction, semi-thermal semi -thermal reaction at 140 degrees centigrade instead of 180 degrees centigrade because we want to make it more green. Now, our main intention was to create a photocorrecting cadmium sulfide. And as I said earlier, with the example, like, like in microphotosensor, we got the copper doped cadmium sulfide. In this case also, we wanted to dope the material with copper. And how could we do that? Well, here we uh, changed the two, two uh, parameters. Instead of the micro the commercial available micro digester, we have just taken the household Godrej made micro one in our laboratory. And uh, Dr. Manish has very meticulously carried out this work without any accident. He has just added, again, he has taken in a typical reaction for, uh, protocol, he has taken cadmium acetate, anti-urea, certain mineral ratio, and mixed in a, a binary solvent system of diethylene, triamine, and ionized water, certain volume ratio, with this time, with the addition of copper acetate, which is with inserter molar concentration. The, again, the resultant mixture was pressed in the Teflon coated autoclave, just a small quantity, which was pressed in the normal household microwave. And that's why I call it kitchen chemistry. We have a pressure cooker. We also have a microwave. And let us see whether we could get results. Again, here, in this case also, we, we have seen this is zero, zero to preferred orientation of the hexagonal structure. And we can get, in fact, uh, much better morphology. This is chestnut husk morphology. And this is a cauliflower kind of a morphology. We could not get, in this case also, we could not find just the spherical nanoparticles. But we we got all the time, because of 002 preferred orientation of the material, all the time we could find the hierarchical nanostructures. Uh, TM, somehow, FETM results are not so good, so I will skip that. 
Now, as I said earlier, cadmium sulfide contains two sublattices in pure state, that is Cd plus 2 and S minus minus. When we replace S minus minus by Cl minus and Cd plus 2 by Cu plus, that leads to kind of, uh, you know, there's a sensitizing center here, uh, which can contribute to photoconductivity, which we have seen earlier. But how do we know? We are just getting Cu plus and not Cu plus plus. There's a likelihood that you may get Cu plus plus, but we presumed that we are just getting Cu plus. And then later on, we confirmed by two important techniques called Aperando XPS. This is the X-ray photo spectroscopy. And these are the two techniques, extended X-ray absorption fine structure spectroscopy and Janus, that's X-ray absorption nearest structures spectroscopy. These are two techniques. These two techniques, uh, in fact, we, we could get a good result and we cannot do it um, here anywhere in India for which we could catch hold of our Slovenian collaborator who has access to synchron radiation facility available in Trieste in Italy. They have regular connection there and they did some analysis for that. Aprondo XPS, what is that Aprondo? Aprondo means while the material shows photoconductivity, the X-ray phototron spectra have been recorded. For example, when exposed to green light, blue light, red light, and the XP spectra, or rather XP spectra, were recorded, and uh, for which we have collaborated with uh, my friends from Belgrade University, very intelligent Turkish guys. They did good analysis way back in 2014, but subsequently I was not available in India, and as of today, we have not done much on this work. They have come up with interesting results. We supplied them two samples. One is a bulk copper dope photoning and we sulfide, and another is micro thermal cadmium sulfide produced as a result of micro thermal reaction. And uh, we have been told that our material shows p-type conductivity, especially in this case, so which cannot be believed in. Normally cadmium sulfide is just n-type. I'm trying to understand what they're saying with uh, this kind of operando XPS business. I myself am not very familiar. I'm trying to understand. And this is still, since we were waiting for the patent to be filed, we are not yet published. Dr. Govin has planned to publish this work along with Manish after some time. This accepts Janus results are very important. It has been done by our friend from Slovenia. I'll mention his name a little later than that. And uh, Janus, copper Janus clearly indicates the presence of Cu plus and not Cu plus plus. This is the best conclusion result. And uh, now we are quite comfortable with this particular reason, we claim that whatever we have presumed is turns out to be correct. Now, this is the field emission. Maybe I won't take uh, much time because we may not uh, get more time for uh, discussion. This is the field emission study. This is the IV, good. And this is, uh, you can just concentrate on this image. This is the, this image shows the field emission. This is the basically field emission image based on uh, our material. The work has been done by Professor More, a department of physics is expert in this area. I myself not, do not know much things about the field emission. What he said is that this is a good result and maybe it has got some application in medical uh, X-ray imaging. This bright tiny spots here can probably correspond to here. This, uh, I'll just show you in a minute. This kind of, uh, you know, portrait, uh, portrait, whatever comes out, these are, you know, this is coming out, this is coming out, maybe more clear here. Yeah, this kind of structures. What, whenever you get uh, this kind of structure that leads to these bright, tiny spots, that's what he said. But I will not spend much time on that. With this, I'll just conclude uh, part two of my work. Synthesis of hierarchical nanoarchitectures we have carried out, like chestnut husk of copper of calcium sulfide, by microwave assisted semi thermal technique. No hierarchical instruments are required to prepare hierarchical nanoarchitecture because this is the bottom of approach. You have to assemble a nanostructure uh, material by putting one unit on the other, maybe iron or maybe a molecule. That's what we have done. We don't require a separate you know, complicated techniques to do so. 
solvent ratio plays a very significant role in altering the morphology and subsequently the optical properties of the synthesis nano architectures. Color of doped architectures are darker as compared to their the undoped counterparts, which indicates that doping has taken place effectively. Now we just um, said that um, the Haraki nano structure, mostly, mostly the chestnut husk kind of morphology of copper of cadmium sulfide displays promising field emission characteristics and uh, all these um, you know all these studies related to field emission uh, will probably find prospective applications uh, in the near future so what is the final conclusion we just started this work with some idea we have come from the crazy to the impossible to the impractical that's what alan huang who is pioneer in light based computers said i just told govin to do so because bulk photoconductivity was a topic of my phd so when i asked dr govin can you do it and produce uh, this kind of uh, microphoto sensor he immediately said yes i don't know how if you ask me to repeat his experiment probably it is impossible he has got very good experimental hand uh, so this is because of his work we have come to a practical stage not uh, really me and these are my collaborators. Mostly, I would like to thank um, Dr. Govind Umarji for first part, that microphone sensor, Dr. Manish Sinde for the second part, that is hierarchical nanostructures for field emission devices. Of course, Professor More for the same reason. And uh, Jem Lee, H.Y. Lee, this H.Y. Lee is a girl. So these are my Korean student and another student of mine who's currently in South Korea has helped also helped me in this analysis. Dr. Malik has uh, is an expert in polymer chemistry, so he has helped us in formulating the thick film paste. Dr. B.B. Kale is my good friend. He has familiarized with me some concepts in the hierarchical nanostructure. Suzer and Mohammed Kapuru from Bilikan University, they are very good. Um, uh, they have very good facilities in Bilikan University as far as uh, upper end is concerned, and most importantly, the Isok Arkon at University of Nova Gurisa, Slovenia, is a very senior professor. He has helped us um, in getting the exception Janus data, uh, which confirmed what we say. And I also like uh, to thank our funding agency, that is a nano initiative program under which we received a lot of grant in aid and going to manage go to their PhD programs. Now they are full fledged scientists at uh, CMET. Also, of course, I could. I'm th thankful to Brainpool uh, Program of Korea for inviting me again and again in South Korea. And Korea Center of Chemical Technology for availing their facilities for my work uh, way back in 2006 and 2007. And this is um, in Korean. It's called Kansamidan. It means thank you so much. And uh, this is uh, my university, Sang Yonkon University, which is also known as Samsung University. Because this is very old university established in 1398, 1398 it was established, but uh, for the last couple of decades, it has been taken over by Samsung Foundation. This university is located in the city of Suwon, S U W O N, and Suwon is the headquarter headquarter of uh, Samsung company. Also, the this university is controlled by Samsung, totally controlled by Samsung Foundation to that extent that. Who will be the president? I mean, something equivalent or vice chancellor. Who will be the vice chancellor of the university? It's being controlled by Samsung Foundation. They have pumped in a lot of money and trying to get their own development to be done in this university. The world ranking of this current world ranking of this university in QS system is 89. It occupies, uh, you know, one of the best universities in South Korea for, uh, uh, you know, electronics research. And this particular building is a library building. It looks like a book. This is called uh, Samsung Library. With this, I think I will, uh, uh, you know, I'll stop my presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, really appreciate the uh, diversified thing you have presented. And it's mm -hmm. also a good thing that uh, you have clearly shown the need and necessity of industry uh, academia collaboration. Samsung right. has taken over that university and developing it, obviously for mutual benefit. And that should be the sustainable aspect because right. academia right. and industry should uh, uh, nourish each other for more sustainable 
development. That is what I said. Though the work has been done by my students 10 years ago at CIMET, still it has got some relevance because of its applications, which like like autocar dreamers or maybe robotic eye or uh, maybe street light controls in the huge housing complexes. So, and maybe some of the defense application, but now we have transfer technology to and ceramics in Mumbai. So they're uh, trying to make some custom built applications, trying to demonstrate to atomic energy, to DRDO, to Israel. I don't know. Uh, because, uh, well, I, mean, I just came to India and then because of the pandemic, got stuck to my own place. Okay. Are we having some questions and answers? Yes, sir. So there are uh, uh, participants from diversified field. Mm. And uh, so we're requesting uh, the participants to unmute and uh, ask direct questions or even uh, if uh, possible, you can uh, type in chat box the questions so that uh, we can have better interactive session. It have a child that uh, probably you have to read it for me. Sure, 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 sir. Okay. That I'll do. That I'll do. So it's open for discussion. Any, any one, any queries? First of all, uh, am I able to convey you know, convince you people that we have done some work. If, <laughs> then the dialogue starts. If you are getting yourself convinced that the work has been done, then we'll have a lot of dialogue. Okay. Now we can ask questions. Because a so, whole lot of uh, yeah, thing you have given both a top down and bottom up approach and starting from sunflower of Van Gogh. So knowingly or, or unknowingly, you may have uh, synthesized uh, a nanomaterial use. Yeah. That is, uh, yeah. Oh. Real good uh, learning for me also. Mm. Really, a whole lot of uh, so much takeaway. So really, I think uh, people are taking some time to get ad ab absorb and absorb both, and we'll come out uh, with some interesting queries. So in between, I have mm. a specific area uh, because, as you said, that uh, technology is transferred. So definitely, uh, uh, there will be a whole lot of other applications, and they will they are also looking after. But what are the other applications you think? it can be useful uh, had you not been transferred uh, so what will be other applications other applications uh, in you see uh, the applications like uh, robotic eye a prosthetic hand which we hmm. just thought about because hmm. our material uh, you know it's a speed of response is so high less than 10 milliseconds around 10 milliseconds it can catch anything so this is important as if you just create a robo then for its robotic eye we need to have uh, you know this kind of uh, micro photo sensor here the, if you look at the traditional photo sensor uh, which is uh, you know li like a button uh, you know like a mm -hmm. button side or uh, this button side but what we talk about it's just a micro photo sensor which can become part of any circuit, whether it's autocar dimmer or the street light control or anything related to defense application. Uh, maybe um, the technology, uh, you know, we have transferred to hand ceramics and they're working on it. And because of pandemic, they also got stuck. That's what uh, Dr. Govin told me yesterday. Okay. So uh, not more than that, I think uh, robotic eye, prosthetic hand, and uh, then autocar dimmers based on based on our micro photo sensor it is not if you can you see you can find a lot of papers uh, you know on ldr's best uh, uh, what street light control as well as autocar dimmers you can find some papers on that but they use the conventional bulk photo sensor what we talk about is the micro photo sensor maybe in some of the surgeries this could be useful so an interesting question came from uh, our uh, uh, department computer uh, person. So Sanket Hajari, he is asking that uh, can street light affect the auto dimming technology of the vehicle? Because in your vehicle light, so based on the light available, so can that auto dimmer technology? Yeah, see, uh, okay, when the street lights are on in city, you are supposed to use your dipper, not the upper. Okay. It means the low beam light we are supposed to use. You can't have really a full fledged uh, upper 
or a high intensity light in the city when you start you know, there are street lights on probably interaction the interaction can take place but the, but it is already on the deeper mode when we travel with street lights on only when we leave the city go to the highways and we don't find and the darkness uh, this intensely dark situation outside we need we need to use the upper and probably you might have seen while we travel on the highway earlier the smart drivers used to use upper and deeper again and again and kind of a signaling upper and deeper again that's a crisis process if you have a microphone sensor that situation may not be the case it also avoid the toxic effect about the accidents but street lights probably will not have any problem because we are all in the deeper mode for that not in the upper mode i think uh, and the speed is also not that great. Uh, yes, it is speed. The, so, so there's no question yeah. of head-on collision, outside collision. Unless and until the driver is drunk, he didn't sleep well, you can't expect the accidents in in city uh, in the night. But that typically happens on the highway. Uh, so there's another interesting question from uh, Tushar Vijayakalam. Hmm. He's asking. Uh, some focus on nanotechnology applications in electric vehicles. In electric vehicles? Because now we are talking about EVs. So how nanotechnology can really help to uh, in electronic vehicles? Well, uh, probably you need to give me some time. I'll just, uh, can I switch over to my another presentation? I think sure, I have to stop, sure. I'll stop presenting here. Sure, and sure, again, sure. go for a new presentation, right? I'll stop presenting. No, 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 no sure. yes, sir. So ah, you can okay. upload now, the other one. Yeah. Yes, that is so uh, ready with so many other things that. Uh, no, no, I will see here. We just said that. Uh, uh, well, I'll. Mr. Dr. Tujar, uh, Tushar Vijay Kadam. Okay, okay. So, application in EV technology. Yeah, yeah. Probably we said that from. Uh, we can say that. Um, Nanotechnology has not yet become disruptive technology like internet. You can't find nanotechnology each and everywhere, like the way in which we have everything associated with the internet. Without internet, we can't move forward in any case. In automobile sector, I think probably the graphene-based supercapacitors or the two-dimensional uh, materials like uh, molybdenum sulfide, tungsten disulfide, this kind of materials, and the, Maybe a whole lot can be done in the battery aspects, supercapacitor and the battery aspects of the electric vehicle. And traditionally, each and every component of the car, sorry, can be made using nanotechnology. I think let me try to find out uh, one more presentation and I'll try to um, describe that also. Yes, sir. Any, anyone? Any further queries they can put in the chat box because there is a total encyclopedia. He is no, not that. Just uh, if you give me a more time, more perspective. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll try to share. Sure. Can you see me now? Yes, sir. Uh, your screen is visible. Okay. Just go to uh, your the presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I... Okay, here. Yes, it's visible. Maybe oh, I forget about this. Yeah, in automotive domain, we can see uh, a lot of application. Uh, see, other than the battery part of it. Probably we can see nanomaterials in uh, fuel cells and batteries, nanofilms for self cleaning, heat shielding, and then to stop polymer glazing, fuel additives. Nano and fuel additives we can't because uh, it is a you know battery operated vehicle. Then um, you can create uh, the, the nano composite coating and the nano composite materials to make the car uh, rather lightweight. So polymeric nano composites, nanoscale sensors. Nano grain engine body, catalyst nanomaterials, and nanoparticles in tires, everywhere you can have. 
and for batteries and fuel cells we have nanomaterials already in place but believe in me this will take some more time and maybe we'll we have already organized one seminar by professor ajit kelkar from uh, usa university of north carolina agrees for complex he has done actually some work on nanomaterials for automobile uh, vehicles part one of the seminar we have already done it uh, with the help of uh, vit and he's going to talk very soon he's going to talk about the nanotechnology applications in the automotive sector probably i hope he will also include uh, the electric vehicle and this is we can see what we can get you take each and every component and what nanotechnology can play that's probably clear here did i answer the question batteries supercapacitors graphene graphene oxide tungsten disulfide tungsten dyselenide which is what we call flatline electronic materials can play an important role in the electric vehicle and fuel cells uh, see nobody will tell you uh, what needs to be done we have to find ourselves the ways where we can attack the the particular automobile sector using nanotechnology. I think uh, this I will stop sharing now. Can you still even in the even in the case of uh, uh, tires, so nanomaterial, uh, so that can increase the uh, of the tire, strength of the tire, so that uh, uh, the uh, yeah yeah yeah. Um, no, that so is possible. Things, so whole, whole lot of whole lot of things can be definitely thought of, and that if, is if, if, out of. You see, the whole idea is to make the lightweight cars, which will have not much load on the battery. So we need, um, you know, uh, whatever components are available, tires, the body, and you can, you know, have a lot of inbuilt uh, sensors for this particular uh, electric vehicle. Maybe some work is going on, but I'm not very sure what is going on exactly, because by these days, many people avoid publishing the data and filing the patents also. Uh, to keep their secrets intact. Okay. Anything else? True. Even uh, I, I understand some people are working on the uh, that uh, seat home. In that also using some nano composite, they want to increase the durability as well as the uh, mechanical strength of the uh, seat as well as make it lightweight. So here are so many. Everything. Everything. So Interiors. Exteriors. Sensing, yes. except the fuel tank, <laughs> everything, yes. can be, yes. everything can be changed using nanotechnology. Yes. And we have already contribution in terms of graphene uh, as a supercapacitor, which could be probably replacement in long term for the batteries in electric vehicle. And fuel cells also can contribute. Hydrogen based cars, then I don't know which will be competing with whom, either hydrogen based cars or electric vehicles. We don't know. Which can win? Yes. yes. So they are uh, developing separately, but maybe sometimes they may hybridize and make something. Yeah, hybrid, hybrid, now hybrid, now hybrid. we have uh, uh, that uh, uh, gasoline hybrid EV, maybe hydrogen hybrid EV also may possible. 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 But I'm I'm not uh, much aware because I myself do not uh, concentrate um, in the nanotechnology. And this was my see my interest by it is just in the nanobioscience not really in this kind of nanotechnology so i really do not concentrate much on this so maybe yourself can find uh, answers for this but then the whole lot uh, you know a platform is open for you to do many experiments true, true. and actually design but what purpose i am asking for what are the material characteristics i'm looking for based on that because now synthesis and all those are to some extent some uh, data are there, so you can uh, yeah. think of some. Uh, yeah, but you know, see, uh, you mean to say that one of the methods for characterization? No, I'm talking about so the, the application oriented. So maybe I want uh, some nanofilm which may be durable and may be dust resistant also. So based on that, uh, we have sufficient data. So we can go back to literature and try to attack a particular thing so that it can be killed with whatever material is there. So. It can be a uh, well-designed uh, uh, plan of work. I'm yeah, it, it, it would be a pre-selected material uh, with the pre, you know, proper planning is possible. 
probably we have to wait uh, till Dr. Uh, Kerkar talks, gives the second seminar uh, under our Bharat Abhiman webinar series, in which we are requesting uh, the giants uh, from my networking, the persons, um, the, the great academicians and scientists of Indian origin in US and the UK, Australia, uh, for our Bharat Abhiman webinar series. So we can specifically ask Dr. Kerkar to give a special seminar or nanotechnology in automobile materials with special emphasis on all vehicles, hybrid vehicles, including electric vehicles, so on and so forth. Just a quick uh, year to uh, some of the uh, people, uh, because uh, Pune University Department of Technology has taken an initiative of the uh, uh, lecture series that is talking about, and Amunanaka uh, sir is the key person behind it. And we are organizing series of lecture under this umbrella. And it's a Zoom platform and it's open. So it, uh, the details are uh, published in Pune University website. And if I'm correct, uh, uh, sir, we are trying to put it in maybe during the uh, uh, science day. Science day. <laughs> so we, we can, we have two ways. Either we request uh, Professor Kerker to talk on the science day, it's a part two of this, which is much more relevant to for today's seminar. Or ask uh, Professor Chirupati Jagdish, who is the president of Australian uh, National Academy of Sciences, a person of Indian origin, and he's going to speak from failures to successes with his own example. He comes from very poor background, and now he has become a big shot. See, becoming a president of Australian National Academy is not a joke. We, he has become. So we have two options. Let us see who says yes to what, but probably I, what I would suggest, whoever have, uh, you know, have registered for this particular uh, faculty development program, you can send them, you can keep them in loop wherever we propose sure. Bharat Abhiman series in the next few months. Okay. Sure. Maybe we are sure. planning February end and then March, something like that. Uh, with your current permission, I'll definitely uh, pass on the message to all the registered participants and mm. uh, with the link so that they can join from their places. It will right, be right. really good outreach. Right, and right. that's a good benefit of that uh, internet. This yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Connected. yeah it, it's very convenient. I, at times it is tedious, but it's very convenient platform. Okay, but I'm not very sure how many are really attending. Maybe we can find some photo of that they're not attending. That could be a problem sometimes. So there is no uh, replacement mm -hmm. for the offline seminars, okay? Because a uh, two-way introduction can be done, but fortunately we have people from Jorhat, from uh, Tripura, from uh, uh, southern part of India till Amritsar and uh, uh -huh. Kota. So this type of thing may not be possible for physical seminar because they may not able to uh, may not like to travel so, so much. We have a hybrid model, both online as well as on site. Okay, That's whenever okay. Dr. Kelkar or somebody else comes, we can ask him to deliver. Okay. Agreed, uh, sir. Because of uh, you know, for ladies, it is very tough to leave their homes. So I hope so. These kind of online seminars are very much beneficial. In the say, you are saying that as not good as you can say in a face-to-face -face working models. But even though for being a lady person, I can just uh, take a favor of these kind of online seminars. At least we go through with the newer technology and the advancement in the science and technology, which is going on in the NITs and IITs. For being a university people, we have a lesser facilities. Even we don't have technicians. We have that much of sophisticated instrumentation, mm. but not good technicians are there with us. Once the yeah. instrument gets you know, damaged, we have to wait and watch for the AMC and everything. See, so online kind of uh, or hybrid seminars are, in my point of view, very much beneficial for the ladies or the career oriented uh, girls. Right, which right, want right. To, no, no, you, eventually, eventually I also learned. OK, so um, just initially I was a little upset to speak online, but now I find this very convenient. OK, but we do not really judge the impact of whatever you are talking it's being understood by the people or not. That's only a question mark. But where are you from, Dr. Shweta? I'm from Kota, Rajasthan, sir. I'm from University of Kota, Rajasthan, India. Okay. And uh, really, I appreciate the efforts taken by everyone. In a hybrid mode, no doubt it will be better one because face-to-face -face interactions are going to be very fine. But uh, for we people, those who are working at home also and leaving their, you know, 
universities it's very tough otherwise i can handle my 3 to 4 class even in the evening also shuffle to the 5 to 6 after 5 i'm handling my theory class to convey my students and enjoying the online mode of this kind of working technology so thankful yeah. to sppu yeah. also thanks shows, to all that shows the good spirit okay now yeah uh, and we are really uh, thank yeah it's a good thing the way you said it really uh, shows your keen interest and uh, willingness so really yeah. appreciate it really uh, thank so you sir thank you yeah, there's one interesting question that uh, in terms of uh, technology uh, so uh, how india or in your opinion when we can compete with korea china like that there's an interesting question came in chat box <laughs> okay uh, you see i have got a special seminar on uh, building the incredible nation through education science and technology with south korea as an example uh, let me just take uh, five minutes so south korea was very poor country initially maybe worse than ethiopia or burundi or rwanda what uh, you are seeing uh, by these days some photographs you can see that's because of the strong war between the, that uh, dictator the clan you know that useless dictator from north korea you know, kim jong un his grandfather and uh, you know there's a great war between the southern part and northern part of korea the total country south korea was ruined by the northern part with backing from china and russia so they have got freedom exactly 2 years ago to us 15 august 1945 korea got freedom from japanese rulers well we got freedom 15 august 1947 from the british rulers but today and they in the country was totally rather ruined maybe, I, maybe i'll show in some of the videos uh, but as on today where are, where are the koreans now they don't have anything no natural resources and uh, at least when britishers left we have our railway lines in place we have laboratories in place we have universities in place koreans did not have anything of that kind left behind south korea particularly but from that onwards they they you know they have done uh, you know extremely hard hard work extreme hard work and there was a lot of emphasis by the korean parents they said that study hard study hard and study hard that's the only way to succeed and lead a decent way in life that's what koreans say and they have done a lot of lot of things it and uh, you can't compete really with the uh, korean uh, giants like uh, samsung hyundai and posco kia lg that's because of um, they put a lot of emphasis on uh, the research even at the university level even undergraduate level the research is compulsory postgraduate graduate level i mean msc level research is compulsory of course we have some uh, you know some universities which are research driven in india india too but korean spend korean government spends 5% of their gdp for research and development and that doesn't involve the research expenditure incurred by the companies like hyundai samsung etc etc so the kind of uh, expenditure you see the fact that after my retirement they called me thrice the very fact that they are intensely research focused all the time koreans like japanese see i would say for last 5 years as far as global innovation index is concerned korea is number 1 which were nowhere in that race korea is always number 1 much better than in united states well we have global innovation index of something like 56 but countries like mongolia uruguay and saudi arabia are ahead of us forget about china china also spends a lot of um, you know money on the research something like uh, if not 5% maybe 4% of their gdp on research and uh, development and it is so okay it's our enemy but let us learn few things from china also Uh, you know probably we had a good beginning but that beginning has remained you know has remained beginning for quite some time there's a stagnancy in that particular case that is that was not the case with korea the point of course is the total fortunately i was uh, fortunate enough to spend uh, almost two and a half years in japan 
happened maybe four years in South Korea. So I could myself witness whatever they have done, uh, you know, for the coming of their life. Chinese, well, you can't believe in, in Chinese case, Chinese researchers get uh, money even from the local self-government, like Gram Panchayat, Jilla Parishad. They have their own funding for research, which is unheard of in India. Here are the state, here are the, in India, even state governments do not give funding for research. We have to get funding either from maybe UGC or AICTE or the DST or maybe now that National Research Foundation will be one entity. But in China, that is not the case. Gram Panchayat funds, Jilla Parishad funds. Japan also some something similar situation. Korea too, the same situation. But Korean themselves spend a lot of money and uh, they go to any extent. So I have been going freehand in Korea. That's because they want to excel. Naturally, within uh, three last three years, I might have published more than 15 papers in top class journals like Nature Scientific Reports with the association of my Korean friends. So it is, it is the innovation is the national character of Koreans. Maybe it's a national character of Chinese also. Well, India, we have, you know, our national character is, um, you know, to get entangled into history. We like his, you see, let's learn from the history, but let's not get entangled into history. Let's have some innovations, uh, but, but it's not our national character. The situation will change, obviously, after some time, if not now. We are forced to change the situation. That's the answer. Lack of funding is a major problem. Lack of national characters and a political will of the government officials. These are the three important factors. Indians are good. You can't say that, in, you see, we, we have produced Nobel laureates. Maybe Calcutta is a good place to get Nobel prizes. <laughs> Siviraman, then Amartya Sen, and uh, Mother Teresa, and, uh, you know, Ravindranath Tagore. So if that's, individually we are good. And we are very good in, uh, you know, other industries, ITs, etc. We have produced the world-class youths like Arvind Krishna, Sundar Pichai, Parag Agrawal, and so many other people. At least you'll find 25 CEOs of Indian origin uh, running, ruling the entire world through their technological severity. But we ourselves can't do it in India. And that's, people are same. They had their all formal educations in India. People are same, but ambience is different. That's the problem. But it, it can be, as we you know become financially strengthened, probably we'll have more expenditure on R&D. That's the problem. So well, well said. It's really that we have those uh, uh, spots and we have those uh, uh, lighthouses. Yeah. But uh, a proper synergistic effect to make it happen in India uh, is really. But uh, so it, maybe uh, there's it's, collective, it's a collective responsibility for all of us. Uh, Sanjay, okay. I just want to like to add to this. Uh, South Korean uh, thing. I was there in South Korea for one and a half year. Okay. So my observation is uh, with a change of government, there is no compromise on developments and research. That's what uh, we lag, I think. Once the fire goes, the whole thing goes down. So that's what I observe. No, that no, is very no. strong. <laughs> Which are party comes, they don't interfere with development I, 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 and research. I, I, there's right. another aspect. The whole lot doesn't go down. Whether it is uh, X government or Y government of India, there is not much of an expenditure on research. That's the yeah, fact. Yeah, that's, it that's is just 0.5 percent of the GDP which we spend yes, on the research as country said. But let yes, me give another very exciting example from my own. In uh, 2017, um, I was in Hanyang University. Probably you know Hanyang University. It's a very yeah. very famous engineering university. And my friend Professor Hewali is a great Indophile. He likes India very much. And we had discussed, I, I spent almost one and a half years with Professor Heaven Lee uh, as a brain pool scientist. And Heaven Lee, once I asked him, Heaven Lee, who is the science and technology minister in South Korea, in the South Korean ministry? He said, okay, Dinesh, he used to call me Dinesh, you want to see? Okay, come on. In the same building, it's called Fusion Technology Center, in our own building. I was sitting on the fourth floor, fourth floor. Heaven Lee was sitting on the fourth floor, and on the 10th floor, there was a professor of chemical engineer who happened to be science and technology minister of South Korean government. Can you imagine that kind of situation in, in India? 
a science a scientist or a professor can become science and technology minister uh, i don't think it is easily possible in 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 india so probably whatever uh, dr satpute has uh, said this is just to substantiate uh, they respect the science and technology whichever government comes in but in india we, yes they do the same thing only thing is that they don't enhance the r and d expenditure that's the problem with india but yes. we can't put a blame it's a big country problems yes, are huge yes. okay thank you sir thank you for the example yeah mm. yes sir whatever we have so just we have to uh, whatever uh, uh, resources whatever is possible so even uh, acit has given a small area to just conduct this so we have targeted to put uh, a couple of points so that at least it gives a good brainstorming and subsequently in our uh, day to day life as well as in our research or maybe with the students we can able to make a bit more uh, uh, thoughtful uh, yeah but i had but whether we can make it sustainable for long that is on us is on us it's it's, it's it problem well, but i i i think the uh, modi government is taking uh, south korea at least very seriously hopefully they get some ideas from uh, south korea and try to implement in, in india also in their vision document you will find the name of south korea many times okay in modi's vision document Okay, sir. I don't think there are many other questions, so we are almost on the end because uh, at eleven thirty there is the second session. Uh, yeah, by Dr. Govind. Dr. Okay. Govind. Okay. Uh, so the uh, legacy will continue. So okay. you are passing on the baton to your student, and he will talk more. <laughs> no, no, no. Yes, see, young people are better than the yes. seniors. They will find it from Govind. Okay. Okay. Yes, so we, can I? We'll, thanks. We'll thanks for. Uh, we'll, we'll be soaked in nano. material for some more time and we'll definitely come out with some more perception and more clarity yeah 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 okay okay so uh, thanks thank a lot you, for uh, asking me to join this particular forum uh, you know of a faculty development program i hope i did my job uh, to some extent not to full extent but at least to some extent okay so thank you can i leave the meeting now Uh, just a formal uh, vote of thanks. We okay. are really we do really appreciate your uh, time. Well, well, I'm your own man. <laughs> Even as professor department, so it's okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. But uh, you have agreed uh, in uh, that to uh, tune up uh, your perception for overall sustainability aspects and have given both top down and bottom up approach and how we can for a particular cadmium sulfide uh, how. it can be useful and starting from the basic uh, what is uh, that uh, uh, photosensors its principle to actual application and also the path forward the uh, entire uh, if we can uh, uh, recapitulate back and with the help of your uh, uh, ppts which can be a guiding block that will definitely help us to analyze reanalyze and uh, think uh, uh, out of the box for betterment we really appreciate mm -hmm. sir for your uh, uh, kind uh, presence and we'll definitely be in touch and uh, uh, with your kind consent if some uh, participants ask for your uh, email id uh, can no we problem. share no problem you. email id uh, uh, start with, your... and if and for more serious discussion later on i myself will share my mobile via email okay so yeah so thanks, thanks so kind of you yeah. thank so you i i will you now Th thanks sure. everybody for sure. your patient reading uh, for such a complicated uh, big title seminar seminar was okay but title was big okay i leave now thank you thank you thank you sir thank you. so thank you all dear participants and i understand